Hey Maniacs, this is Mark. Uh, the audio for this episode isn't quite right because of something we ended up doing in the studio, but it'll be all back to normal next week. Thanks a lot, and hope you're having fun on quarantine. Now, on with the episode. The pheasant moves! The pheasant moves! It does! Its head moves! Oh my god! Hey, Maniacs. Hey, Maniacs. Midsummer Maniacs. Midsummer Maniacs. I'm a maniac. Are you a maniac? Oh, man. We (laughs) are in the throes of mania right now. I've been in the house for a really long time. You know, (laughs) I really wouldn't suggest cooping yourself up in a house with three teenagers working on major projects. No. It's just... uh, but you know, we're lucky. That's the only thing we're dealing with right now. The kids are awesome. The kids are awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we know as we're putting this episode out that many of you, like us, are on self quarantine, social distancing, extreme, stuck at home, don't go outside unless you have to, Ness. Yep. First of all, we hope everybody is safe. Absolutely. Uh, and if you're not safe, you should be washing your hands. And Jezebel. Jezebel. And then second of all, uh, we hope that everyone's uh, doing mentally okay with all this. It's a lot to go on. This is the most traumatic thing that's happened to the world since I've been alive. Yeah, and it's weird because you have the news and the trauma of the news. And then, you know, if everything's kind of okay where you are and you're doing what you have to do, then you have to deal with the... I'm really tired of being in this houseness and all of that that can bring on. (laughs) So hopefully you have lots of projects and work to do. Yes. I have lots of work to do. I'm really tired of people saying, wow, I'm so bored. Like, okay, I can give you some work. Yes. A couple of things. Uh, One, uh, because I have more time, I've been experimenting with music off the top, as you probably heard. So we're uh, trying out a couple of different things. Let us know what you think. And also the last mini episode that we did was uh, our suggestions for what to watch other than Midsummer Murders. And we asked for your suggestions, which were all great. Absolutely fantastic. Keep them coming. Keep them coming. Um, I think that thread helped a lot of people fill in a few holes of what they wanted to watch. And the official Murdoch Twitter account gave us a little shout out, too. Whoop, whoop. So that was <laughs> nice to see. I know that... Um When things are kind of rocky or tough, you you sort of want things that are cozy and reliable, but you can't watch the same things over and over and over again. So it's nice to have a recommendation from somebody who likes the same things you do so that, you know, if you start watching it, it's going to be okay. So if you do watch an older episode of Midsummer Than These and you haven't listened to the podcast, watch the episode and listen to the podcast. There you go. There's an activity for you. Yep. And... You know, maybe there's a a recipe that Joyce makes that you might want to try. You never know. Actually, (laughs) I I haven't looked in this week's uh, issue of the Mid-South Murders magazine. The the recipe in here is Irish stew. It's a type of stew. It's a kind of stew. (laughs) It's a kind of stew. Oh, Joyce. She makes a splotchy fruit salad, though. I can tell you that. Yeah, this is like lamb stew. A traditional Irish dish. It's hearty and should turn out better than Joyce Barnaby sort of stew. Wow. Wow. So if you have a snack that you're making at home, let us know about it. Yep. Absolutely. We can all keep each other company. Okay. So this week we're talking about. So if you've got a snack at home that's keeping you sane, recommend it to the rest of us. Absolutely. And now onto our regular scheduled program, which is Midsummer Maniacs podcast dedicated to the ITV series Midsummer Murders. Each week, we dig into an episode of the show, including the murders, the mayhem, the loonies, and everything else we love. There's a loony in this episode I really love. I love Benbo. I want to cuddle Benbo. Oh, he's so good. <laughs> he's so cute. He's so cute. <laughs> Especially when he's lighting the place on fire. Yeah. So we're going to go over the episode at kind of a high level, and then we're going to dig into some fun stuff. Just remember, if the show is too much for your kids, the podcast probably is. Even though it's a pretty tame episode. Yeah. There's no beheading or squishing or... The next episode has stuff. Dismembering or anything. Anything fun. No. 
<laughs> Just shotgun blast. The whole episode is about this pub, the Made in Splendor. So this is a made-up pub, and it goes along the lines of, like, aptly named pub, pubs, right? The, the idea is that the pub is a place that reflects the story. But this pub is the story. Yeah, but except the, so the, the, the maid and Splendor that are referred to in the name of the pub and the name of the episode, Splendor is supposed to be Lake Splendor, but it's a pond that doesn't even look deep enough to go fishing in. It's not even a pond. It's a ditch. Yeah, it's a ditch filled with water. <laughs> that has like a smooth rock right beside it, like that Jamie falls on but isn't concussed by convenient isn't it yes the hotel that they use is actually the george hotel in 25 high street dorchester on thames that's the pub and yep. it's an inn too yep cool you could go stay at the george yeah well in the maybe in, later in the magazine there's a whole two-page spread on dorchester Ooh la la it's not a very big place but i i went through the whole town on uh, google maps <laughs> Not a very big place, but it looks very nice. I'm sure it's nice. Yeah. So the pub is owned by uh, Stephen Bannerman. It was formerly owned by his dad, Michael Bannerman, who has now kind of retired from the pub running business and handed the reins over to Stephen and his wife, Lorna. Now, Stephen Bannerman looks awfully familiar to me. He should look familiar to you. He's played by Alan Cox. Yeah. He was Watson in Young Sherlock Holmes. So we've had the two leads from Sherlock, Young Sherlock Holmes. A great movie. If 1985. You, if you've not seen Young Sherlock Holmes, oh, go watch first it. of all, go watch it's it. It's like candy for your brain. It's bizarre and crazy and fun. And Spielberg. It's Spielberg, yeah. remember? Yeah. And it has some of the best visual effects at the time. Oh, definitely. Like there's a scene in which a person is hallucinating. That a knight comes off of a stained glass window and fights them. And it is beautiful. Well, and Alan Cox playing Watson hallucinates about um, uh, dessert pastries attacking yes. him. <laughs> and those are evil, CGI Because he's a little more chubby. He is. Do you know he's the son of Brian Cox? Oh, he's Brian Cox's son. Yes, the actor. Oh, I love Brian Cox. He's got something to live up to there, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what did you do today? Oh, I was only in five movies and six shows. Is that it? <laughs> I was in 16 movies. <laughs> and I beat people up in every one of them, even though I'm 75 years old. By the way, Brian Cox is an awesome guest star in Shetland, one of the shows that I recommend. He's in either the first or second season. He plays the guy... Who's like the crazy Benbow character. Yeah, yeah. He does such a good job. <laughs> so so Stephen's got some plans for the pub. He wants to update it. He wants to take out the... The snug. The snug. Thank you. I was like, koozie, snuggle, <laughs> hug, the hug bar? No. The koozie bar? The snuggle bar? No. The so snug. The, the snug is like this little room at the back of the pub. It's like a mini pub. And I haven't even told you this yet. The, the, the reason why I know Snug is because my father used to drive us to town to get groceries and do whatever we were doing. And then I'd sit in the car while he went the Snug. <laughs> <laughs> well, and doesn't, um, traditionally, doesn't a Snug have like a pass through from the main bar instead of a little bar like this one has? Uh, I looked up Snugs and I did a little bit of research on them. Mostly, it's meant to be a place where you're not seen. So Yeah, it's like a private room. It's, curtains are pulled down. Women, like, I remember in Canada, there being a men's and women's entrance to the bar. Mm -hmm. And that, that women's entrance would go directly into the snug. Well, and like in Peaky Blinders, the snug is like a private room. Mm -hmm. and, and the drinks are passed through a little window. It's like their private drinking room there. Yeah. So there's a couple old guys who hang out in the snug. Oh, old guys. You got, you got Clive Crookshanks, who's terminably grumpy. I don't know why Clive hates everybody. He's got a garage. He's got a family. Yeah, a nice got wife, a nice, a nice, got a nice son. Wife, He's got a business. A nice it's not like his son is robbing people like the butcher's son. I think I know why he's so grumpy. Why is he so grumpy? His hat doesn't fit. 
Well, he can't pull it down over his ears. It just sits on top of his head all the I time. I don't think you could cover those ears ever. <laughs> And you've got Wesley. Wesley, who reminds both of us of a person that you've never met, which is a friend of ours. <laughs> yeah, but he's got the ponytail and the dog. And he's kind of, so So Clive is, is super grumpy. Wesley is kind of the normal one of the three of them. He's got mm-hmm. a vehicle, a dog, a home, presumably. He looks like he's showered, sort of. He may even have a wife. And then there's Benbo. Benbo. Played by Freddie Jones. No work, Crow. Freddie Jones was also in Young Sherlock Holmes. Yes, he was. He plays Chester Cragwitch, who's a crazy professor. What do you know? Yep. So we've had three people from Young Sherlock Holmes in, I think, this season. Mm -hmm. You know, Freddie Jones was also in three David Lynch movies. He was in... Can you name them? He was in Dune. Yes. He was in... (laughs) No, hold on. I'm not going to tell you. I'm just laughing at the silence. He was in Blue Velvet? No. No. That would have been weird. Lost Highway? No. Elephant Man? Yes. Ba-boom. 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 No, the third. Wild at Heart. Oh, yes. He was also in... I've only seen Wild at Heart twice. Freddie Jones is also in Eric the Viking. We've had some people in that recently. Kroll. Kroll is a fantastically bad movie if you ever want to watch one that's really bad. (laughs) It's an 80s fantasy crazy fever dream yeah well it makes flash gordon look fancy and sophisticated he has a special weapon that he throws that has blades on it there are blades all over it so i always wondered how he threw it or how he catches it yes he certainly (laughs) can't catch it and then um freddie jones was also in an awesome hammer movie called frankenstein must be destroyed in which his brain is replaced with a weird brain yeah and he becomes a monster yes but he's so cute. But I remember you were telling me he was in a Hammer movie. And this is the one with Peter Crushing. I'm like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's not narrow it down much. Oh, and it's a really weird, crazy Hammer movie. Yeah. Um, uh-huh. Mm-hmm. I've not narrowed it down no. at all. Yeah. No. But yeah, he's forcibly has a brain swap. And then he becomes a monster. Nice. <laughs> Poor Freddy. I need to watch... Well, you also know he's again. Toby Jones's dad. He's Toby Jones's dad? Yeah, but we've talked about that before. Oh my gosh. So everybody else is everybody's dad in this episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, well, these actors, you know, England's small. What about Michael Bannerman? What has he been? Michael Bannerman. Um, he's also in another episode of Midsummer called The Dark Rider. He plays Ludo de Ketville. Yes, who is when there's a... Headless Rider. Yes. Yes. And um, his name's William Gaunt, by the way, the actor. My favorite movie from his long history of acting gigs is a movie from 1971 called The Sinister Man. Have you heard of this movie? No. I'll give you the one sentence summary. You're going to want to watch it. Are you ready? When a corpse is found in the Thames, the only clue is that the dead man was killed by, I'm going to guess, a karate or judo expert. What? Yeah, you heard me. Okay, I need to see this movie. <laughs> it's called The Sinister Man in 1971. Okay, that's what we're watching tonight, baby. And William Gaunt. Who Saturday plays... night of the quarantine. <laughs> Sinister Man. <laughs> it's not that bad yet. We've got lots of things to watch. Yes, we do. Yeah. So that's, that's William Gaunt. Excellent. So we've got Stephen and his dad, Michael. Right. Who um, Stephen owns the pub with his wife, Lorna. Because who's... Michael gave him the pub. Right. Because he had heart problems uh, when his wife died and he's not supposed to drink. But he drinks constantly. He is an alcoholic. Oh, I'm my gosh. He drinks right so much. now. But, you know, if you owned a pub, it would be hard not to have a drinking problem. I, it would I, either be incredibly easy to not have one or really hard not to have one. I can one or the see other. both ways, but it is. The alcoholism is the word that should be in this episode that isn't. The maiden alcoholism? Yeah, I think so. The maiden alcoholism. The alcoholic in splendor? (laughs) That's a completely different show. (laughs) And so we've also got another family there. We've got the Mondays, Audrey and her daughter, Bella, who both work at the pub. Who worked at the pub as long as he can remember. Yeah. Audrey is madly in love with Michael. And I think you can see it all the way through. You said you didn't notice it early on, but you can see it. I didn't notice it in other viewings, but I noticed it right away. Yeah. One of the first things she says to him. Especially when she kneels down beside him. No, one of the first things she says to him is she catches him in his office with a drink looking at a photo of his wife. And he says, she says, it's time to move on. It's been three years. Yeah. 
which I, I think is not a good way to encourage somebody to move on. Like, come on, come on. It's been three years. Love me now. It's time for rumpy pumpy with me. That's, that's not motivating. No, no. So Bella and Audrey also work there. And as does Jamie Crookshanks, son of grumpy hat doesn't fit. Yes. Um, who's our first victim. Yes. He gets shot with a shotgun out in the woods, outside the cottage of love. So the cottage of love that we see in the cold opening is where Bella meets somebody. We find out that it's, it's Steven. Steven. Mm-hmm. It's and a hunter's the, cottage. Yeah, and Michael notices this, but doesn't kill them on that night because I guess Bella's there. And he owns it. Yes. Michael owns that hunter's cottage. So then he comes back the next night because he thinks that they're going to meet again. And it's actually Jamie trying to interrupt Bella and Steven. And so Michael kills Jamie. Because Did Jamie, I get all the names right? Yes, okay. because Jamie is unfortunate enough to have gotten a new hat and jacket from his parents as a gift. Yes. So he looks like Steven from a distance. So he gets two in the back. With the old shells. Yep. Then, of course, Michael has to kill Steven. He failed the first time. But Steven's still moving forward with selling the pub. He's going to sell it. He's not just going to renovate it. He's going to sell it to Lawrence, who's... You know, Mr. Uh, Frosted Hair from the big city. Yes. By town. Him. His buddy says town. He's I'm from like, town. Right going on, back to buddy. town. <laughs> We're going back to town. He's clearly trying to buy up the whole village. He's been trying to buy Crookshanks' garage for a while. Yeah. So, so the thing that we're not telling you is that Audrey is kind of instigating or moving forward or suggesting all these deaths. Audrey wants Michael for herself. So she's telling him things that he w- otherwise wouldn't know, like that Michael has plans to sell the pub and that um, Stephen and Audrey, uh, Stephen and Bella, sorry, are going to meet at the Hunter's Cottage and yeah. basically egging him on. Yes. Right. And I think this is all caused because Bella knows that Stephen's going to sell the pub. Yeah. No. Audrey knows that. Sorry, Audrey knows. Well, that. Bella tells her everything. Yeah. Right. So then I have a problem because... Okay. I don't know the exact words, but when Stephen is confronted by Michael in the alleyway, mm-hmm. right he before goes, he shoots him, he goes, what are you doing here? And then sort of laughs at him and then gets two to the chest. Well, right? in the reenactment at the end, when they're going over what actually happened, yeah, Michael says something to him like, I've heard you're going to sell the pub. I won't let you do that. And Stephen goes, ha, 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 yeah, you can't stop me. Whatever. Like Stephen has a whole soliloquy here. He's on his way to Lawrence's to sign the paperwork. Where's Lawrence's? Oh, right over here. On the other side of that wall, <laughs> next to where he's shot. When when they find Stephen's body, Barnaby goes, where's Lawrence's? And he had been there that day. Yeah. And it's right over the hedge. Oh. It's not a big village. I think it was that day. I don't know. You can't even begin to delineate days in this episode. It's weird. I'm not, uh, the so, timeline is so weird. So this episode takes place in Midsummer Worthy. And the map that's in the murder map... Yes, I did say murder map. The uh, magazine shows a town much larger than the actual town that this pub is in. So they've invented streets and yes. <laughs> whole neighborhoods and everything yeah. else. Yeah. yeah. I don't believe Dorchester has a stoplight. <laughs> that would make a big difference. Yeah. yeah. So Michael wants to stop Stephen from selling the pub. And Audrey's like, oh, he's out there right now. He's off to sign the paperwork. <laughs> so Michael shoots Stephen. And then Michael sort of loses it yeah, and grabs Bella and says, let's go out to the woods. I need to talk to you. And because the real thing is that Michael isn't in love with Audrey. No, he's in love with Bella, which is ew. which is why I hashtag the reminder for this episode. Creepy old man. (laughs) (laughs) Because, okay, Michael Bannerman is easily 65. Mm hmm. And Bella is shown to be probably less than 22. Yeah. So there is easily a 40-year age difference. Yeah. And, okay. All we can say is that maybe she looks a bit like his dead wife. Well, except for the eyes and the nose. (laughs) I can't believe Audrey says that. Yeah. Michael shows her a picture of... All of them at the Hunter's cab- Cabin when they were younger. A badly photoshopped picture. A very badly photoshopped photo. And says, look, and look at your mother in this photo. And she does. And he says, she looks a lot like you. And she says, well, yes, she does. Except 
Her nose is much bigger and her eyes are too close this together. This is what Bella says. Like, gee, thanks, Bella. That's nice. I gotta tell you, I'm, I'm blowing the lid off this episode. Bella is not a nice person. No. Bella. She completely manipulates Scott. Yes. She is played by Sophie Hunter. Okay. Who is married to Benedict Cumberbatch. Sherlock again. Yes, I know. The connections never cease. Yes. But she's not an actress anymore. She's an avant-garde playwriter and director. Oh. She's won a lot of awards. Oh, that's cool. Here's a weirder thing, though. Okay. Audrey Bunday, her mother in the episode, is yes. played by Frances Tomalty. Okay. She was married to Sting. Oh, so we've had two Sting wives. Yes. They had two kids together. Tantric kids. <laughs> I don't want to know about that. Do not want to know about that. Did I mention I don't want to know about that? <laughs> oh, but there, yeah, it's interesting. Anyway, there's no Sherlock connection there. No. It's just Sting. Sting. Just Sting. Sting and his bits everywhere. So Michael admits that he's in love with Bella and says, if you won't be with me, I'm going to kill myself. He's got Which a shotgun. Which is the saddest thing ever. She's, he's even talked her into taking his boot off for him. So that he can use it to, to pull the trigger it. with his weird green socks. Yeah, I, I, those green socks don't look... I, I would be like, oh, I'm not going to touch your boots. Yeah, I, she's very nice to have helped him out of his boot. That boot, that sock smells like old man. You can tell. And, and that's basically the whole episode. Yeah. There's some... Oh, and instead of shooting himself, he dies of a heart attack. He has a heart attack, yeah. I mean, there's some little red herrings here and there. And, of course, Collie's back running a movie festival. They have an erotica section. It's I'll all sold out. I'll save you tickets. But I'll save you Joyce is like, oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I and what was sad was this episode... Was like last we watched it last week when you know all the craziness happened. But Max Moncito just recently died, and he's in Seventh Seal. Yeah, which is a great movie. In I, like, I think Scott gets screwed in this episode. Yeah, they make him out to look pretty stupid. I don't think he's that stupid. I don't think and if he, he likes, gets Ingrid Berg, Bergman and Ingmar Bergman mixed up, and if he likes, which I understand, but I think he's smart enough to have looked into it a little bit. And if he likes Ingrid Bergman, you know, I'm not saying they're the same person, but he knows quality. Yeah, if he likes Casablanca, he, he's not like a bro movie guy. Yeah, and that and there's a poster outside the theater that clearly is not Casablanca. Yeah, it's Seven Seal. <laughs> Seventh Seal, which is an iconic movie, what, what it made me think about, um, and Scott even mentions it that death plays chess yeah. in the movie, right? Yes. And if you've never seen the Seventh Seal, you don't even get the reference in everything else. There's so many other places yes. where that's referenced. Death playing chess is in Bill and Ted. Yeah. Last Action Hero, yep. and even the Animaniacs did a thing about yeah, it. Yeah, it's all referencing Seven Seal. Yeah, it's that classic of a movie. And, and it's a good movie. Mm -hmm. It toddles along. It's not like, oh, well, you just sit and talk. There's interesting things going on, and then you sit there and go, oh, my gosh, Max Ronzino is 15 in this movie. So while we're talking about that movie and the movie poster, it's a double feature. Yes. At the top, it says the seventh seal. Yes. And at the bottom, it says the Spanish writing school. Yes. What is that? I have no idea. Oh, God, I thought you'd know. I looked everywhere. Come on, man. <laughs> no, no. I looked everywhere. <laughs> the only thing that got me off of that was they walk out into this where area, and there's a lot of stores in the background, so I'm trying to find out where they are in reality. And it has this thing that says the bell shops or something off to one side which Audrey goes down in this weird scene with Michael that doesn't need to be there. No, she's shuffling off in a trench coat like Casablanca. <laughs> if only she had a fedora on too. I found a reference to that lane <laughs> in Oxfordshire City Council notes. Oh, wow. But it didn't give an address. <laughs> Did it mention a Spanish writing school? No. Okay. I easily look for that place for two hours. <sighs> you know, I trust you to look up all the stuff in print and have answers. 
I, I could not. That movie doesn't exist. Well, audience, if you know what that's a reference to, let us know. Yeah. Because we're clearly stumped about they that one. They made it up like the Maiden Splendor legend. Don't even get us started on that. <laughs> All right, let's talk about pubs. Okay. Because clearly pubs are important in this one. So pubs are like, okay, I wish we had pubs here. I know. I do. We've I talked do about that often. Wish it, it, I miss pubs. I had pubs in Toronto. I used to go to pubs all the time in Toronto. Play darts in pubs all the time in Toronto. I, I definitely miss pubs. It's one of the downsides of living in a college town. All of the bars are really geared either towards students which means they're rowdy and obnoxious or the professors and professionals which means they're uppity hoity toity or, or they're like hard drinking places i just want a place to sit and talk to my friends maybe play some trivia like sometimes maybe, maybe play a pub quiz yeah not trivia a pub quiz a real pub quiz not yes. computerized trivia yes. no doesn't exist in bloomington no. there used to be one called the players pub it's gone gone a couple of things i looked into one was uh i wanted to know if they let dogs in pubs yeah because wesley brings his dog in this is a dog episode wesley has a dog michael has a dog yeah so what's the story there can you take a dog in a pub it's up to the pub owner oh completely up to the pub owner and there's no law against it you know what else is up to the pub owner what your band Oh, so tell us about banning. This is so interesting. So Stephen bans Clive, right? For life. He's been wanting to do it for a long time. For life. And I thought, okay, so as long as you own the pub and you're there, maybe you tell your employees, look, don't let Clive in. He's banned. Yeah. Right? He's bad. Yeah. Then if the pub changed ownership or whatever, that would be it. It'd yeah. be over, right? And maybe you're banned for a period of time. Like the bartender says, look, I don't want to see you in here again for a week. Well, he does pull a gun. But anyway. Yeah, well, there is that. But he's banned before that. Yeah. In the UK, banning somebody from a pub is a bit more serious than that. At least now it is. Okay. It's so serious that... Well, it started out as kind of an informal network of people who owned pubs and like restaurants where they would share information with one another about, hey, you know, Clive was in here last night. He brought a gun in. He's banned now. You might want to keep him out of your place, too. Right. Yeah. Word of mouth. Absolutely. Word of mouth has now become formalized. Oh, and there's an app. There's an app called Pub Watch. Pub Watch. Where owners of pubs can register their pub and they can enter information about people who are banned. Oh, and you know what? If you're banned, there's nothing you can do about it. That's it? You might not even know. They're all private stuff, right? Yeah, it's all private stuff. You can't appeal no, it's it. called the public house. It's, it's weird English. <laughs> yes, it's like private school, public school. So you can't appeal it. There's nothing you can do about it. It's like having your mug shot in an app that only a few people can see. Peace. So you might go into a pub in a completely different place, and they would say, you're not welcome in here. And you'd be like, why? What, what did I do? Well, pfft, I got you on the list. Because somebody two villages over said you're a troublemaker. I never got banned from a pub. <laughs> it's it's like a whole. It, the, the website is impressive. Pub I, watch. I'm telling you. Pub watch. Go it's, have a look. It's an industry now. The other thing I wanted to know about. Well, two things, and they have to deal with time. First of all, if you haven't been in a British pub as an American or a North American, time is at roughly eleven o'clock. You mean the, the end of serving hours? Yeah. Yes. Which took me by surprise at first. Far earlier than it is here. I was like, I, I remember I went, I was like, I went to England the first time in a hotel in Piccadilly. Um, my time's all warped off. It's like nine o'clock at night. I'm like, I'm going to a pub. I go to a pub and the guy's like, oh, you get, this is last call. I'm like, 10 o'clock on Friday night, dude. <laughs> I'm sure there are clubs now that are open later, but they're clubs, not pubs. Yeah, clubs, not pubs. <laughs> they call time. Now, Stephen... And they play a, a fox hunting horn. Yeah, Stephen oh, does. Oh. Not everybody does. No, they usually have a bell. They usually have a bell, but Stephen wants to be extra annoying. So wow. he plays the fox hunting horn. <laughs> I just wait for a big pack of dogs and just rush into the bar <laughs> and shove everybody out the other side. So then they take a towel. Now, remember towels? I, I told this fact already that the first time I watched Mastermind in England, the guy was 
an expert in towels of pubs. Pub towels, yeah. Pub towels. And puts them over the taps. And I could not find why they did that. Just to say that they're they're done? I know, but why is it a tradition? Who started it? You know, is there a special name for it? All those things. I think it's just a tradition. Yeah. Because people know that's what that means. Yeah. And you, you might have also noticed that when Stephen is opening the bar... He puts towels down on the bar and f- by the taps. Yeah, there's special rules with the towels. And that's because when they fill a beer, they fill it all the way to the top, the very, very tippy top. Yeah. And then they set it on the towel and you put, pick it up off the towel. So if there's any like spillage. It goes on the towel. It goes on the towel. Yeah. The other thing they have is beer mats. Yes. And in the Maiden Splendor, they have beer mats on the um, rafters. Oh, okay. There's, it's like a collection. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I know there are people who collect beer mats. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you find some strange people? Uh, no, but I found some really freaking expensive beer mats. How are they expensive? <laughs> oh, my gosh. There was somebody on eBay UK who had a pack of 1940s Guinness beer mats. Yeah. They're like 20 to the pack. Yeah. Unopened. Yeah. Twenty-five thousand dollars. What? They're unopened, never used, pristine. That's insane. Crazy, crazy. The I other- also love in the pub when they take the knife and put it across the top. When they shave the foam off. Yeah. The other thing is that um, I guess a, a lot of in smaller pubs like this one, like in village pubs, the waitress will keep your tab on your beer mat. Oh, okay. So as you order a beer, they'll just mark it on your mat, yeah, okay. and then they can tally you up. Okay. Um. But I also learned a very interesting thing about beer mats, about where they're made. Okay. They've been around for a long time. So these are the, no, they're not coasters. They're like, it's like a coaster. It's like a coaster. Yeah. It's a little square a pressed cardboard. board. Yeah. Yeah. Originally, they were ceramic. Oh. Now, why you would want a ceramic coaster, I don't know. No. But they originate in Germany. Okay. And it's really when they moved from steins with lids to steins without. Right. And as soon as you get into steins without lids, you get... Without a lid. <laughs> you get spillage. Yes. Right? And they're like, hey, I don't want stuff spilled everywhere. We're going to put a coaster under that. I have to keep opening up my lid to drink my beer. <laughs> so in a town called Wiesenbach, which is in the Black Forest. You know it is. There is a company called the Katz Group. Okay. They, the, Wiesenbach only has a population of about 2,500 people. How many right? of those 2,500 people are employed in making beer? All of the adults. <laughs> okay, every single person. They manufacture between 5 and 8 million coasters a day. A day? They manufacture beer mats for the world. Wow. In this one place. They- Nobody has started to make them somewhere else. I don't know. Maybe they've got like a patent on them or something. Oh, wow. So they take wood from the black forest. They pulp it. They turn it into beer mats. About 7 million a day. It is the industry in Wiesenbach. Now you know. Now you know that that beer mat collection you've got. It's all German. It's all German. Yeah. And they started so, bef- between the wars. So what happened in the Second World War? Was there a beer mat shortage? I guess there was. There was a beer shortage, so there probably wasn't a need for as many beer mats. <laughs> what I tried to find was what that factory was repurposed to make. During the war? Yeah. Ooh. I couldn't find anything. Mm. Maybe they were making that cardboard armor like that fat kid wears in Jojo Rabbit. Maybe. <laughs> if they if you haven't seen Jojo Rabbit. <laughs> oh, you got to watch it. It's great. So movie. awesome. <laughs> But yeah, all those Guinness beer mats, all the Corona beer mats, you name it. You think they're so local? No. No. Wiesenbach. Well, see, now I want to go to Switchyard and say, where did you get your coasters? Mm Mm-hmm. Which is a local brewery here. Yeah. People don't know that. If I could go outside. (laughs) You can go outside. You just can't be around other people. The grocery store was insane. (laughs) (laughs) Every man for itself. And no crushed tomatoes. <laughs> of all the things to be out of. It's so strange being out now because when you go to the grocery store, it's not that they have shortages of regular things. It's just weird things. 
Well, it's because people, the people at those companies aren't working or they're not shipping or they can't get it or it's delayed yeah. or and whatever. Like the pasta aisle was decimated. Well, pasta lasts. Yeah. Right. So, anyway. <laughs> it's so easy to get off on the topic of we've been stuck in this house for a long time. <laughs> I mean, I'd rather be in that situation than everybody around us. Like, is we're sick. so lucky. We have. We're lucky, lucky, a lucky. Nice house. We have great kids. We're really not bad off. No. There are a lot of other people who are not bad at off. Not at all. But it's, it hits everybody, man. Mm. You want to talk about somebody who's not bad off? Who? Lawrence. Lawrence? He has a PA who serves him champagne every day at five o'clock. Yeah, uh, she I does want one of those. She does a little more than serve him champagne. Well, I don't. She's want there that. till two in the morning. I don't want that servicing him and the guy who's going to town. <laughs> Speaking of two a.m., Clive's alibi is that he has has at an anglers club meeting in Coston until one in the morning. But, well, you see. That's the fishing club from the other episode. And so he was avoiding getting hit in the face by, <laughs> by a dead lady. By a dead lady. <laughs> I'm just thinking that maybe there's a strip club in Costin called the Anglers Club. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Gentlemen's Club. They stopped serving at 11, but you know, we hung out. <laughs> we stayed for a while. Lawrence, Lawrence is with his crappy backyard. His wealth is weird, right? Yeah. He's, a, he's a property developer. His house is not bad. He has a nice house, but it's not nice enough. And why does he have a house there? He's just buying up stuff and redeveloping. Yeah, why does he live there? I don't know. He does have a nice convertible that he drives Bella around in at the end. Yeah, Bella's, Bella's the winner of this episode. But he has rifles that cost $120,000 is, is each. That, is that possible? I could not find, and I looked. I could not find an antique shotgun going for that much. Now, I found some that were close. Okay. And they were all the same brand. Purdy. Purdy? P-U-R-D-E-Y. Is that an English brand? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. I found um, a a website that specializes in antique weapons, antique shotguns. Okay. And they had a pair of Purdy's. Mm Mm-hmm. And they sure were purdy. They were purdy. You can't not make that joke. Um, and they were going for fifty thousand dollars a piece. Now these are from the eighteen nineties. So fifty thousand American dollars or fifty thousand fifty thousand pounds. pounds. Sorry. Okay. But yeah, who knows what that equates to? The stock market. Woo, woo, woo. You know, coronavirus again. Um, Apocalypse. But there were no. There were none over like you know eighty thousand pounds. Oh, well, maybe he get those two special ones. Maybe he got a bad deal. He maybe, maybe got ripped off. There's a really good episode of Lovejoy that revolves around antique guns. Mm-hmm. So they know that the shotgun that killed Jamie is the same one that killed Steven because of the shells? They don't or- know for sure, but they can check that the firing pin makes a unique mark on the end of the shell. And I did some research into this, and this is actually one of the advancements in forensic science in the last 10 or 15 years of that they now can really tell if a shotgun shell has been sent by shot by a particular shotgun because of the placement and of the marks that leave because they put it under a microscope and they can see the marks that it leaves and compare them to another well, shell. Because with a pistol, you have a casing and there's rifling inside the barrel that yeah. ensures that the bullet will shoot straight, right? And they compare that. But a shotgun isn't like that. It just has a hammering pin that just hits the back of the shell. Yeah. And sets off the charge. Right. That shoots the pellets. the wad and the pellets out. Right. So it's looking at the impact of the firing pin on the back end of the shell? Yes. Oh, wow. That's a much smaller footprint than yeah, it would be on a bullet. a much a, smaller a footprint, bullet. but they can now do it. So. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Because I guess... The article I read that said that there was a kind of in vogueness of shotguns once they figured out rifling. Well, and you could saw off a shotgun. And plus, the 1988 legislation that Barnaby references in this episode still made owning a shotgun easier than owning any other kind of gun in England. Well, and that was because, so that act was. Vers- in response to the Hungerford Massacre in 1987, which is a horrible event. 
I never heard anything about it. Yeah, though. I don't remember hearing anything about it. 16 people were killed by a man using two legally owned semi-automatic rifles. So then after that, every gun had to be registered, including farm shotguns. Yeah, and he had a handgun in England. Mm. Like, oof. That's, no, no. that's right out. The police yeah. don't even have those. Yeah. Well, they do now, but yeah. they didn't always. Yeah. Speaking of police, Scott calls them wooden tops. He does. You know where that comes from? No. Nope. So I thought maybe it was Cockney slang. No. Nope. For like cops. Yeah, wooden you know? tops. No, oh. no. Oh. It refers to their helmets. Okay. Way back when, when they were bobbies. Yeah. Their helmets were wood. Really? Because like in Murdoch and Miss Fisher, they're leather. Over wood. Oh, they're actually over wood. You know that peak at the top that kind of comes to a little point? Yeah. And the, the old fashioned ones? Yeah. That's wood up there. Wood. It's supposed to, to protect your head. Somebody hits you. I guess. It's like a helmet. Yeah. Right? Not a hat. Yeah. They're called wooden tops. How Scott would know that, why he would have that slang, I do not understand. <laughs> Joyce, Scott, and Cully get the short shift in this. You say Scott is not very stupid because he didn't know about Ingmar Bergman that he might have known that. But he is stupid in another way. He's stupid enough to catch free meals off of Joyce. Yeah, okay. Of <laughs> all the places to get a free meal. He shows up because he wants a free, me free meal from Joyce, which is where the great Joyce line, it's a kind of stew, <laughs> comes from. So whatever that kind of stew has, it has green bits and yellow bits. I'm assuming peas and, and corn. And then brownish bits. Yeah. But that's all we know about that. Stew. And kind of a sludgy consistency. And Barnaby's also there. I don't want you here. You can't drink my wine. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he just wants to be off work for a little while. But he's not there to work. He's there to eat. <laughs> but he and still works. And if he works. eats more, there's less leftovers. Than that's get true. Off for <laughs> In the second meal that we see them eating at home... Cully goes over to the sideboard and gets something out of a bowl. It, it, what caught my attention is it makes a <laughs> sound when it hits the bowl. It's like a splat. Like, what is that? It's fruit salad. And then Cully's all non plus that he took off doing his job. Yeah, but he did ditch her. He, he didn't did say, ditch her. he didn't say, get your own way home. He is forgetful. I'll give you that. Yeah, but he was working. Yeah. And, you know, he did ditch her in the big city. Big city of Costa. Yeah. It's well, so dangerous. She couldn't stay for the Spanish riding club. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I miss the Spanish riding school mystery movie. Aww. Yeah, that fruit salad. Jinkies. I've never had fruit salad that went splat. Yeah. <laughs> Joyce. She's bitter. Cully's bitter about the whole thing. She's and she doesn't need to be there at all. Just, oh. But she organized it. I guess. The erotica season. So we've got a couple of corpses. Let's yes. talk about who's the best. Okay. I have my own opinion. Okay, before we talk about who's the best corpse, mm -hmm. I want to talk about the maid in Splendor. Thing. Okay, go ahead. So the first time we hear the maid in Splendor story, first of all, okay, let's back up. There's two pictures that they've made for this show. Yes. There's a painting in the pub, and then there's the pub sign. And the pub sign. Two different things. Mm -hmm. But they're identical. So they've made this legend up. Yes. The idea is that some a, a knight goes to the Crusades. Yes. Comes back. This is a common story. Theme. He's gone for a long time. Gone for a long time. Lots of knights did this. Mm -hmm. Comes back. And his fiance is so beautiful still. It's like she hasn't aged. Mm -hmm. So then he throws himself into the pond to save her from her commitment to him because so that she can marry somebody else. Okay. And then she's so upset. She, she throws, throws herself, herself in the lake. Now, if you look at the picture closely and I did, it's not like she's drowning. You she, think it is. She sort of looks like she's waiting to catch a beach ball. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like throw it to me, throw it to me. Like, she's not even really all that upset. Like, well. I'm looking at the picture in the magazine here. Like, she's just, she has hair, like dark hair. She's naked. She's, she's nakedy naked. Her but, hair's covering her breasts like Lady Godiva. No, no, no. Her breasts are underwater. Oh, okay. It's deep <laughs> enough. <laughs> they don't float. Just, 
just when you were wondering if we watch these episodes too closely, <laughs> I'm staring at the picture of the painting trying to see if her boobies are out of the water. As a woman over 40, I can tell you they float. <laughs> her boobies are not floating. She's too perky for that. Okay. Yeah. And that, that's the story, right? And then they, Scott's like, that's a weird story. He's right. It's a weird story. Yeah, because then Bimbo at the very end is like, oh, that's not how it goes. That's not how the story goes. He tells this whole other story about a brother, and he throws the maid in the water because he's upset with her. None of this has to do with the main story of the show. No, it's not. It doesn't parallel the plot of the episode at all. If you were making up a story and doing two paintings, should at least relate somewhat to the story. Right. So the story Especially should because the pond is named Splendor. <laughs> the story should be that the old knight comes back. His fiance has married someone else and now has a daughter and he's in love with her, but she doesn't love him back. So, so he, he dies of a heart attack. So he throws her in the lake. After he kills his own son. Yes. And another guy back. How could he him. have a son if he was at the Crusades? You don't know. Okay. No. Corpses. Jamie. Steven. Steven. And. You well, can't we, count Michael because he's not really dead when the camera see, pans away from him. All we see is his foot. Yeah. On the stretcher. And you got to give it to Jamie because Jamie is the only one that we see. And really. he's lying on that rock. But there's a better corpse. Who's the better corpse? The pheasant. The, fe- <laughs> the pheasant moves. The pheasant moves. It does. Its head moves. Oh my gosh. And I don't think it's a real pheasant, so I don't know how it moves. <laughs> but its head goes. Ah. So they show this pheasant. That supposedly Wesley, has Wesley shot. is shot, and they show Jamie as a moment of, you know, it's a dead thing. It's mm-hmm. another dead thing. Right. It got hunted. But then the pheasant moves. <laughs> its head lolls. Lolls. I'm giving it. I'm giving best corpse to the pheasant. Okay, best corpse. <laughs> to the pheasant. Let's talk about after the credits. Okay. So Michael's dead. Yeah. Audrey's in prison. Yeah. Bella's with Lawrence. Yes. Clive and Maureen. Yeah, Clive and Ma- Clive is still angry and Maureen's still upset. Forever? Yeah. They don't sell the pub? They're eventually got to sell the, the gas station because Lawrence is putting them out of business. Yeah, I would think so. What about Lorna's restaurant pub? Wait. Yeah, how much time passes between Michael dying and Barnaby going back to the pub? Because, wow, it's transformed completely. Wait a minute. Wait, okay. At what point in time does it seem like an intelligent thing for Clive to do to say, get out there and pump some gas, woman? <laughs> <laughs> She's crying over her dead child while pumping gas. <gasps> yeah, he doesn't even seem Would you upset. Like to let it or not let it? <laughs> <laughs> he is an asshole. Diesel's on sale. <laughs> Jamie loved Diesel. Jamie loved Diesel. <laughs> He's a jerk. Of course he makes her pump the gas. Okay. Now let's talk about Laura. Lorna. Lorna. First of all, why is she even in this episode? To be the example of the worst teeth. There is no reason for her to be in this. If, if she wasn't in this episode, right? And Stephen, because Stephen told Bella that he wanted to go away with her. Mm-hmm. He could have left the pub to her. Could have left the pup to her. He could have. He could have still wanted that if he was a single guy, right? Yeah. There's no reason. Why is she there? I don't know. To, to she, kick Michael out and make him desperate to confront Bella about his love because he was going to be homeless and he's got to live with somebody. I guess. And then she tells Lawrence that she's not selling the pub, and she makes it into this fancy, fancy place. No work clothes. Poor Benbo. And no one's going to go there. No. No one is going to go there. <laughs> I looked at that pub at the end and went, I don't want to go there. No. No interest. She is going to fail miserably. Benbo and Wesley make out okay. Benbo. Life, life goes back to normal. Yep. They'll have to find another pub. They'll have to go all the way to Badger's yes. Drift to drink. They will, in fact, have to find another pub, including going all the way to Badger's Drift. That's Benbo says that, doesn't he? Yes. I love when Bimbo's in the hospital and he's still got his sock hat with a feather on. Yes. <laughs> he's so cute. Yes, well, that squeeze up. <laughs> cute little Bimbo. 
But then Bella. Oh my gosh. So Bella, who manipulates Stephen into the man she loved is dead and her mother is in prison. Yeah. That's not good. And she's already in Lawrence's car. Yeah, but how much time has passed? I, Lorna had enough time to completely renovate the entire pub. And Bella must own the cottage now because Audrey went to jail too. Right. So Bella... She does okay. She's probably sad. She's close to her mom. I don't know. I don't trust the emotion that she portrays because she takes Scott and wraps him right around her little finger. That's not her fault. That's his fault. Okay. Okay. Drooling is not in the handbook. Drooling is not in the handbook. Scott is culpable, but she does it. Well, yeah, she's a pretty girl and she knows she has an effect on men. Just how could she not? That's everything. Yeah, absolutely. Can I tell them about my project before we go? Yes, we got lots of time. Okay, so we got nothing but time. We've got weeks of time. Yeah, people were like, are you guys going to still do the podcast? I'm like, yes, to keep us sane. It just means that we get to close the doors on a room for a little while and be in it. It really eats up time. We should pretend we're recording for a while longer, I think. Really? We should do a couple (laughs) episodes. So my project, my secret project. Yes. I kind of, I referenced it last week, but I wasn't ready to kind of tell what it was. And now I feel like I've built it up too much, but... I'm not done with it yet, but here it comes. This is what I'm doing. Okay. I have a hypothesis. That's good. You started your research with a question. Yes. Nerds. <laughs> Scientific. That's method. what we are. My hypothesis is that some villages are more violent than others in midsummer. Ooh. So I've begun an analysis drift. of the kinds of deaths that happen in each of the villages. Because this is midsummer worthy. There's at least two other episodes oh. in midsummer. Oh, worthy. yes. I have a massive spreadsheet now. And actually, there's a map in on the murder map page of the whole county. Oh, so we can see the relationships. Yes. So, for instance, it's north of Mallon Bridge and west of Coston and south of Marshwood and Morton, uh, Morton Fendel. Oh. So here's what I'm going to do. Before we record the next episode, yes. I will have completed my analysis and yes. I will share my findings. Can we record the next episode tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> but the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to share the spreadsheet. Yes. We're going to link it out. It's a Google Doc. Yeah. So people can make a copy of it and do their own analysis. Can I make a graph? I like sure. Graphs. Excellent. Anybody can. Okay. So it'll be a lot of fun. Yeah. And maybe other people will see things that I didn't see, and that'll be cool. I've had a relationship with this show for a long time. Technology has changed over that time. And I always wanted to start Midsummer Wiki. Mm-hmm. I always did. And folks it's have. A, I, I did Wiki research early on. Right. And folks have. The Wikia for Midsummer has. It's awesome. great. Yeah. I reference it all the time. Mm-hmm. They absolutely have great information. Great pictures it is a great resource. Absolutely. But it's oh, there's just so much stuff, mm-hmm. you know. And so I think that's interesting that we'll do that. We'll get some more information back on it. Yeah. And we have another update. So the other update is I have applied to take over the Midsummer Murders Reddit subreddit. Yes, because the moderator abandoned it. So if you're on Reddit and you want me or somebody like me to take over that Reddit, you have to go to what's I forget the name. Just look in my posts. I'm type writer Mark. I'm type writer Mark everywhere. <laughs> and look in the post and uh you'll see that I posted saying that the guy who is moderator of that group hasn't posted in like three years. Yeah. So, so we're hoping that we can get an active moderator. If it's not you, then it's somebody not me, that's fine. So I, we can bring mind. that community back because yes. it's a great place. That it should be a place where we talk about midsummer. Yeah, yeah. You know, for the young kids. Because Facebook is the older gentleman. I'm not old enough to be on Facebook. <laughs> all right. Maniacs, stay sane. Stay like, okay, first of all, all the love. Thank you this week again. I, I've noticed that more people have been downloading our stuff in the last two weeks. I wonder why. <laughs> I've, I've talked to several people about catching up, and my gosh, we took a week off, and there are some people who are like, 
you're coming back, right? right? <laughs> we need you to come back. So if you know somebody who doesn't listen, who you think would enjoy it, by all means, recommend it. We don't make any money off of doing this. No. And if it gives them a little no. fun while no. they're stuck at home or under a lot of stress, then I hope we can help. We do this because we love the show. There is a tiny, tiny cost incurred by the show that is enough. Like it's my less than my coffee money. Right. In a month. Yeah. Lots less. So if it makes you happy, we're really yeah. glad. We, we totally do it because we love it. And it's fun and it's interesting. And, you know, it keeps me off the streets because I wander them now. <laughs> <laughs> but six feet away from anybody that you encounter, yes, right? Six feet away from it. Finally, you can cross the street to avoid somebody walking your way and they'll say thank you. Yes. <laughs> and, we, and we do plan. We do plan on getting to England again at some point. And if we have not completed the series by then, which I don't think we will have, we will at least do at least an episode in England. And since everything is 15 minutes away from everything else, you all in England can come. Aww. We'll have to find, maybe we go to George. Maybe we there could record go. at the George. If it doesn't have Lorna's stamp on it. <laughs> if it's Lorna's, George, I don't want to go. There's no snug here. No. I can't, no work clothes. <laughs> I'm wearing my work clothes. So, so Bembo, like the reason why I love him is because my dad knew all the characters in the neighborhood yeah. like that and sort of took out care of them. Like if he needed some work done, it was always a guy like that, that he would come and do work for us. They always had weird stories and they always smelt weird and they're always <laughs> interesting. And they're fascinating. Yeah. yeah. I think my dad is one of those people now. <laughs> And it's awesome. It's Am great. I turning into one of those people? Not now? yet. Oh, I'm a, a wee podcast in <laughs> I'm going to get you a sock hat with a feather in it. <laughs> oh, we're rambling now. Hey. Okay, maniacs. We love you, maniacs. Stay yes. sane. We will stay uh, safe. See stay you healthy. Next week for episode 34, which is uh, season seven, episode six, The Straw Woman. Ooh. Season seven has seven episodes in it. So Straw Live Woman. Live burning. Yes. The Straw Woman is the next episode, which is the last one. And then they have their first Christmas special. Yeah, yeah. Which is a doozy. I love that episode. We'll have some with fun. With the crazy, the crazy kid who does all the magic tricks. Yeah. And uh, the weird uncle. and Oh, so many good <laughs> stuff. Good things. All right, maniacs. Until next week. Bye, maniacs. Bye, maniacs. told me it was okay. I know. Whoa. Don't get drunk on me now. You were being good. Is that better? Yes. Yes, it is. Do we need to start over? No, no, no. Okay. We'll be fine.